hopefully that's enough time for everyone to come in. Um, I wanted to start today with an acknowledgement of country. So I'm joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Jagara people here in Brisbane. And I wanted to just pause and reflect on the fact that I'm on their country, I'm um, in their cultural space, and I'm lucky enough to be able to join you from here. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and also acknowledge their ongoing connection to country. Um, I think the only bit of housekeeping that we need to do before we kick off is uh, the Q&A uh, box is at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to type any questions that you have in there and they'll come through to the panelists and myself. Um, if you want to have a chat going as well, there's obviously a chat box as well. So questions in the Q&A and chat in the chat one, if we can keep it that way, that'd be great. Um, without further ado, I'm going to kick over to all of our wonderful speakers today. We've got four people who are going to share their stories and their perspective with us today. So um, first we've got Marion Renouf. Um, and I will just let you introduce yourself, Marion, rather than me do that, if you're happy to do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, go. Can everybody see that? Yeah, yeah, it looks perfect. Oh, thank you. Um, so, Wanya Nulam, that's... Um, Welcome everyone um, to uh, this afternoon's session. Um, my name is Marion Renoff. I'm a proud cubby cubby woman, um, but I'm actually joining you here today from the beautiful Quandamooka country in the Redlands, um, specifically um, Wellington Point. So I, I too would like to do an acknowledgement. Um, and, you know, acknowledgement is you know, some may think is a, um, or in you hear that it's, you know, it's a new thing, you know, that it's, um, you know, something that's only been, you know, sort of been um, government and, and that have been doing, you know, for the past, you know, few years or, you know, even 10 years. But um, in actual, it's actually an ancient um, protocol um, that we, that we do this. And um, yeah, I'll, but I'll, before we start, as I said, I'll, I'll do the, uh, the acknowledgement to country. So we pay our respects to the Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this land, um, their spirits and their legacy. The foundations laid by our ancestors, the first Australians, give strength, inspiration and courage to current and future generations towards creating a better Queensland. We recognise that it is our collective efforts and responsibility as individuals, communities and government to ensure equality, recognition and advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queensland across all aspects of society and everyday life. We are committed to working with, representing, advocating for and promoting the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders with unwavering determination, passion and persistence. As we reflect reflect on the past and give hope for the future, we walk together on our shared journey of reconciliation where all Queenslanders are equal and the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and communities across Queensland are fully recognised, respected and valued. So I'd just like you to, um, to I guess, to, to reflect on this, that the fact that we are the oldest continuous culture um, and we do, we do have the oldest continuous culture on the planet. So our First Nations people have lived for over 65,000 years um, on this great country of ours whose knowledge, languages and beliefs practised then are still alive today. Rich and vibrant societies thrived in what we now know as Queensland. Our ancient culture is older than, than ancient Egypt. We've survived, adapted through our Ice Age. Our rock art and fossils prove just how long we have been here, even coexisting with megafauna. Mungo Man and Mungo Lady, dated 42,000 years, are the oldest human remains found in Australia and some of the oldest in the world. 
Mungo Man remains the oldest known and dated burial practice. Anointing of his body with ochre before and during burial. Recently returned to be buried on country in 2017. Mungo Lady, the first recorded cremation. Queensland is unique with two distinct First Nations peoples. The mainland territory covering 1.5 square um, a million square kilometres from the tip of Cape York to the snowy areas of the, of the border of New South Wales. To the north is the Torres Strait, a water, waterway consisting of hundreds of islands between the NPA of Queensland and PNG, a land bridge once connecting the two countries some 8,000 years ago. Caring for country is more than just looking after plants and animals. Animals. It's about keeping a sustainable balance between what we care for country and what we give back. We have a deep spiritual connection to country. Every part of nature is connected back to us. What we take from the land and what we leave behind remains a part of the places we call home. We were the first inventors, constructed many tools still used today wood and rocks to make axes, hammers and boomerang. The first seafaring people in the history of mankind built canoes carved out of trees and sealed with resin to make their, their vessels um, watertight. The boomerang, the woomera, the first instances of aerodynamics in history. David Unipon invented or contributed to the motorised hand shears and also developed the helicopter design years before the first helicopter was built. Song lines can be de described as a musical map of the land. As our people moved across country, songs were sung about the environment, which remind us the direction to go, where we are and where we have been. They can be songs about a tree trunk, unique rocks, chants about the changing weather, the difference in dirt or even animals that crossed our path. Song lines teach us the responsibility we have to care for country and for each other. And sadly, everything changed. Over a period of less than a century, these resourceful, adaptable and competent peoples were dispossessed of their lands and subjected to alien, hostile laws of Britain. Destructive government policies were imposed that annihilated their society, destroyed their languages, cultures and connection to country. The impacts are still being felt today. We, we thought it would, um, it's important to touch on that first notion of terra nullius. Um, you can claim a country in three ways. Um, the first is conquest, they could, um, war. We know that that didn't happen here in, um, in Australia. Um, session, essentially meaning a treaty. Now we know that that didn't happen either. Um, but how Australia was settled was this notion of terra nullius, um, the notion that, you know, um, we, it was an uninhabited land, um, a barbarous country. They carry... Um, the Englishmen carried not only their laws, but the sovereignty um, of the state. And those who lived amongst them and become members of the community also became partakers of and subjected to the same laws. So, again, it was important to, um, to touch on this because what it does, it cements those narratives about us, that we were closer to animal than human. It made those early policies and legislative positions more palatable. And this is just a bit of a timeline of our state's history of how, um, you know, the, the different um, uh, policy policies that um, had impact on First Nations people's lives. Of course, you know, we've got the, um, you know, the referendum you know, which essentially, you know, meant that um, the constitution that was ri originally written up 
um, the 1967 referendum basically dispelled um, and got rid of those uh, pieces of, of the Act that um, that deliberately um, left First Nations peoples um, out of out of the constitution. A lot of that was it was at a time when um, oh sorry, you know at a time now where people you know were a little bit confused by that because it was they think it was about voting rights. We actually had voting rights a little earlier than that, but um, but essentially it was about that um, that piece in the constant or those pieces of of the act in the um, the constitution that that refers to. Then we've got, you know, stolen generation. So what this is just showing is how recent, you know, some of these policies and legislation um, uh, had existed. So stolen generation, the last family removed, it was in 1969, 54 years ago, showing, you know, actually showing my age, but I was four. The last known removal in 1971, 52 years ago. Um, First Nations people, uh, in, were included in the census, and that was only 52 years ago. The Mabu decision that was um, sent to, um, passed down in um, 19, no, sorry, 1992, and as a result, we have the creation of the Native Title Act. Incidentally, Queensland, um, the Protection Act of 19, eight, oh, sorry, 1897, was the most oppressive in the country, and Queensland was the last jurisdiction to cease um, this type of legislation. So we're here to talk about um, treaty today, and so, you know, you might be thinking, you know, why does Queensland need a treaty? Well, what it will do, it will set the foundation for a shared future between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the Queensland Government. It will allow parties to come together and negotiate a new way of working and set the foundation for a positive coexistence. It was once described to me um, at another forum um, about what, what it means, what you know, the um, you know, we, where we get to that point of treaty. And the the person that was um, you know was at the forefront said it's like a yarn that should have happened back then that never did. You know, if you can picture you know um, the new settlers and colonialists sitting down with Aboriginal people, you know, talking about okay, you know, shared country, you know, that that piece of country, you know, set aside for for farming you know, and which was okay, but please just, you know, let us have, you know, this this um, bit of country for, um, you know, to practice ceremony, uh, pra practice our culture, um, and also, you know, please leave our sacred sites to, uh, to us as well. So that's the sort of things that could have happened but didn't. Um, so treaty will allow parties to come together and negotiate a way of working and setting the foundation for po our positive coexistence, as I said. So consultation um, has identified three major themes. Inclusion. Treaty is a conversation for all Queenslanders, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Reconciliation, truth-telling and healing are at the heart of our journey towards treaty. And being treaty ready that all, all Queenslanders feel ready and supported to participate equally in treaty negotiations, being treaty ready. When talking about treaty itself, oh, yeah, as I said, um, you know, it should have been that yarn um, that happened, you know, way, um, way back then. So... This um, this slide here just shows you um, the pledge uh, of First Nations people and non-Indigenous Queenslanders who participated in the signing of Queensland Path Treaty Commitment on the 16th of August 2022. 
The commitment signifies a collective pledge to be courageous and curious, to be open to hearing the truth of our state's history and to collaborate in readiness for negotiating treaties. What I can do is, um, you know, uh, actually send a link through the, because I won't read read it all. I'll leave it up there for, for another 30 seconds or so. But um, I can send a link to um, to where a, a lot of information is held within within the um, Queensland Government's web, website and to where the um, uh, statement is held as well. So the path to treaty is a significant step forward in reframing the relationship with First Nations people. It's a pro process through which all Queenslanders can recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of the lands, wind, skies and waters we now share. The path to Treaty Act 2023 was passed by Parliament in May 2023. The Act provides the architecture and framework to progress treaty in Queensland by establishing the First Nations Treaty Institute to work with government to develop a treaty making framework and support First Nations groups to prepare for treaty negotiations. Establishing a three to um, three year five-member truth-telling and healing inquiry to hear and record the historical and ongoing impacts of colonialism and facilitate truth-telling and healing. The First Nations Institute and Truth-Telling and Healing Inquiry is expected to commence in early 2024. Holding truth-telling sessions and hearings will be on a voluntary basis. Um, there will be power to compel CEOs of state government agencies to provide documents and to make a written written submissions uh, to the inquiry. Um, the next steps on path to treaty will build community understanding of our shared history and support the process of healing. Um, it will set a way forward for, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander pe uh, pe um, excuse me, peoples and the Queensland Government to work together um, and share ideas and start working out what becoming treaty ready means. So why is truth telling and healing a key step on path to treaty? So any treaty must be based on truth. The truth about our past will help Queenslanders understand how modern Queensland came to be. As part of Path to Treaty, local truth-telling will take place in Queensland community through our public institutions, our libraries and archives. A formal truth-telling and healing inquiry will follow this to be held for a period of three years so that we can hear and record our shared histories and truths. It will be a difficult and traumatic for all Queenslanders involved. That is why truth-telling must be combined with healing and the appropriate support. So we, um, as a, um, a team, I, I didn't mention that I, I worked for the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Futures team in the Department of Resources, that um, uh, at a time when recently we actually got to um to meet with some of the members of the um of the of the institute uh sorry the interim body i should say and um and what they were what they relayed to us is some of what they were hearing in the community so they had um you know undertaken you know lots of discussions with community on this and um and they went out and what they did was they provided us with some um uh, yeah, with some views of um of what the community was saying. So the Institute's treaty making framework will provide guidance for Queensland's treaty negotiation process. While there are many unanswered questions, we have heard those yeah, from, from the ground that indicates that treaties start from the assumption that First Nations people were the original owners of the land we now know as Queensland and endured 
injustices as a result of colonisation. There is much to learn from the opportunities and the limitations of the native title process. There is much work to prepare Queensland for, for sorry, to be treaty ready, including work for governments to support out of the box frameworks that are not based on norms, concepts usually applied. Preparing First Nations to be treaty ready will entail working through issues of trauma that has been created by past and current government processes. Land-based outcomes could be included, um, as I said earlier, in the, the treaty negotiations. So a range of outcomes um, that could be included, um, you know, things like protection and management of cultural sites, waterway, uh, sorry, waterway use and management, a land use planning and development, parks and wildlife management, cultural landscaping and architecture. And as you can see, and you probably um, would have read um, some of those um, quotes and that that came directly from community. Um, and as you can see, native title um, features, you know, quite heavily in some of those um, those statements, which is very very significant for um, for our department. This is just a bit of a timeline on, um, you know, sort of where where we've come from from uh, with treaty, and you know, it actually just goes up to February, um, but it, where it talks about the bill, but of course in May the um, the legislation actually got up and was implemented and in place. So just to give you a bit of an idea. So how are we implementing treaty? So the next steps for industry in Queensland government to work toward um, to work towards parts of treaty is to build community understanding of our shared history and support the process of healing for individuals, communities, and our state. Set out a way forward for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and Queensland government to work towards a future treaty, tr um, treaty or treaties. Um, and together to share ideas as well. So for the very first time in resources, we've in, we have included a First Nations specific strategic priority, which reads, so it's priority five, a reframed relationship with First Nations and non-Indigenous Queensland as we deliver on our path to treaty. And as a result, and I, um, this can be found on our um, on our department's web website. So I won't read, you know, go through um, it de detail by detail, but I will talk about as a result of that. Um, we've actually developed what we've called Walk the Talk. It's reframing the relationship and treaty readiness plan, 2023 to 2026. It was developed to deliver on this um, strategic priority for a reframed relationship. Um, and as the lead agency for native title, land rights and mining business, the department's historical and current work practices have at times been lengthy and re-traumatising re for First Nations people. So our vision will be to draw on the ancient wisdom of the world's oldest continuous culture and we'll improve our governance systems and we will amplify uh, First Nations voices to reframe the relationship. In our collective, um, in our collective commitment to healing, we recognise the department's role in past acts of dispossession and discriminatory legislation that have left an enduring impact um, on uh, impact of trauma, cultural and educational loss and economic disadvantage for First Nations people and continue to experience that people continue to experience today. So our focus, we will build a greater understanding of connection to community and country for First Nations people reckoning with our past and present shame through truth-telling truth and a move towards a just, equitable and reconciled future. We will embed our commitment to First Nations determination 
uh, self self determination, cultural safety, visible leadership, and accountability throughout the department. We will prioritise employment, remembering that um, as a whole of government that we have a 4% target, um, prioritise employment, yet retention and development of First Nations people. We will improve our legislation process and systems to facilitate opportunities for economic benefits for First Nations people. We will create culturally safe practice systems and processes and we will have meaningful engagement that respects community, community-led decision-making processes, timeframes, and cultural responsibilities. In developing the plan, the department recognises that good governance means having a strong First Nations voice to allow informed decision-making. This understanding was in, integral to the creation of the plan. Resources leadership agreed to bring together critical leaders to form the path to treaty working group um, and has commenced um, this important work. The Path to Treaty Working Group agreed to be on ongoing key stakeholder, uh, uh, sorry, a key stakeholder group and committed to supporting the development and implementation of the Walk the Talk plan. The department formed a cross-functional working group made up of senior leaders who are passionate advocates. Um, and this group walked alongside our First Nations network uh, within the department to guide and inform the development of the plan. Both the working group and the First Nations network will play a key role in implementing the plan to ensure it remains culturally relevant, effective, and most importantly, respectful. That's a wrap from me. Has anyone got any questions? Thank you so much, Marion. I um, very much enjoyed the call to be courageous and curious as we work through this process. So I yes. think that's, those are very, very powerful words. Um, I don't think we've got anything in the Q&A um, section at the bottom. So we might just keep going along the order of um, presentations. And then there, there is an, op uh, an opportunity at the end of the session to have a more informal general discussion with people. Um, so hopefully we'll get uh, some questions come to you in that format, or they might pop up in the question and answer as we go along as well. Morris, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, so our next uh, presentation or uh, information, I've been told there's no presentation, there's just Joshua telling us a story and his point of view. So I'm very much looking forward to this. So we have Joshua Gorringe uh, with the Mythica Aboriginal Corporation. And I will leave it to you to introduce yourself a bit more fully, Joshua. No worries. Thank you. Everyone can hear me okay? Yep. Righto. Um, my name's Joshua Gorringe, Mythica Aboriginal Corporation General Manager um, from far southwest Queensland around the Windora, Birdsville, Baduri area. Um, we have 55,000 square kilometres of country we look after, 33,000 of that being determined um, country and 30, uh, another 22,000 square kilometres of country that's undetermined that we've got last man standing rights on. Um, I jumped on the, um, the webinar purely to talk about reframing um, and future-proofing sort of the um, relationship between mining companies and um, native title groups, I suppose. Um, a big thing Mythic has been a part of is mining in the area. Um, we had, we've had, we, we had a lot of mines in the area at one stage, a lot of ATPs and um, exploration going on. Um, there's not a lot. We've only got one sort of area at the moment that's under production for oil um, on our determined country. Um, the big thing that we find is um, when Indigenous groups are always the last to sort of find out about um, the mining sort of side of, of um, the government sort of stuff and mining and, and be the last sort of to be negotiated with by mining companies. Um, a big thing that we've been pushing for the past oh, 
I think, eight odd years since we got determination in 2020, uh, in 2015, is that that relationship really needs to get a lot better um, organised and, and get us, get native title groups involved from the very get go of, of any exploration work or, or mining sort of side of things. Um, because we, we find that we're the last hurdle that a lot of mining companies and resource, um, their resource industry has to deal with where their last sort of hurdle that they have to jump and at, at times it, it's very time consuming and, and a lot of native title groups don't have a lot of money to employ lawyers and, and stuff like that to go through the legalities of setting up mining agreements and stuff like that. So, um, we like I say, we've been saying since 2015 that we'd really love to see um, the mining industry, resource industry, um, take a more proactive um, path to um, discuss and talk to native title groups and, and probably big thing is jobs. A lot of agreements that we've got currently with some of the ATPs and stuff that are still current on our country, a lot of it says um, there's wording in it that there's opportunity for employment. Um, but obviously there's there's opportunity and then there's um, actual employment. Um, so a lot of our agreements that we've done since sort of 2015, we've really pushed that there is opportunities. We, we, we've got the people out on country that have got the skills to work in the industry. Um, and we'd really love the people, most native title groups would really love the opportunity to to set up a business, whether it be contracting to the mining companies or something like that as well. It also, there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of native title groups are highly underfunded, um, especially in this far southwest Queensland and probably a lot of other areas too. Um, so the opportunities for us is very limited um, out on country. Um, currently we have a small rangers team as well as we've got a contract mastering must and fencing a FIFA team that does fence stuff like that. Um, trying to resource things like that as a native title group with no sort of real um, income coming in um, due to the pastoral houses, the pastoral enterprises and the mining industry out on country. Um, there's no real opportunity for... Um, us as Mythica to to really do love the opportunity on our own land one day again and have the opportunity to, to um, showcase the stuff we can do on country. Um, so, but the big thing with 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 mining and stuff is especially in the Channel Country. Um, we've just gone through the um, riz with with um, the environmental side of things about the risk of mining on the floodplains and the channel in the channel country. Um, we weren't consulted one little bit when it came to those production licenses issued. Um, and then we were sort of on the back foot the whole time, sort of trying to get why why anyone would want to damage such a beautiful in place that's got their song line a lot of it's like in amongst it. Um, so hopefully through that process, through the series and all that, um, hopefully we get better things of the floodplains. Obviously we're not we, we do know mining needs to exist. Um, as we as a society is very um, resource oriented and we need the resources for fuel and energy and stuff like that. Um, but we, we all really um, take on take on board the complete destruction and annihilation, I suppose, in better sense of the word, but purely because it's the last of the free-flowing desert river areas anywhere in the world. So to not have any consultation with with any of the native title groups in, in the area um, is extremely frustrating, and it ta it's, takes a lot of time and energy for groups that are already under-resourced to go and lobby government, go and speak at different forums, get get um, jump on a plane and travel to and from Brisbane or 
to where a mining headquarters is and stuff like that to have a yarn and try to sort of work out a more um, equitable approach and easier approach to better look after the environment as well as the cultural heritage out on country. So in the future, I, I would really love to see mining companies as well as um, the, especially the resource um, resource sector of the government to take a way better and more proactive approach to um, the way they deal with mine, uh, with native title groups and cultural heritage groups of different areas around the state of Queensland. Because um, if you if you start an open conversation from where it go, it, it everything seems to flow a lot easier, um, and people aren't up in arms straight away. Um, where we find out lastly, the first things we do is react because we know what damage could possibly be done from different mining activities to our cultural heritage as well as the environment and um, other aspects of the area as well. Um, so I'm hoping that um, with all the talks of Pathway to Treaty, the voice and stuff like this, this will be a really big step towards um, really engaging with First Nations people and, and having a honest and um, straightforward approach and, and talk to discuss the future of different areas in, in across the state of Queensland. Um, other than that, that's about all I have to say. I, I think that's such a powerful message. Thank you so much for sharing that. Josh, I really, really appreciate hearing what it's like from the other side. Like it's so easy to get caught up in one's own world, but hearing how the experience runs for someone um, in your position is, I think, something we all need to listen to quite heartily. Um, so thank you very much for jumping on and sharing your perspective with us. I greatly appreciate it. Again, I don't think we've got any Questions in the Q&A for you at this point in time? Um, no worries. So... Pardon? No worries. Thank you for the no opportunity to talk. All right. Thank you. Um, if you can hang around, we'll have that uh, open Q&A at the end as well for people. Oh, something just popped in. Oh, just a big thank you for, for sharing your uh, thoughts on the situation. Um, all right. The next presentation we have is from Leroy Wilson. Would you like to um, give yourself a bit of an introduction and uh, take it away? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, good day, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. And um, yeah, just before I start, I'd like to acknowledge country as well. And um, I'm coming from Durumble country at the moment, up in Rockhampton. Um, but I'm... From out of Bark Holden originally, um, Barky Boy. So I'll just share the screen. Um, and just before I do as well, I'd just like to acknowledge um, uh, someone I work really closely with, Marion, who was um, spoke first. So um, as an elder of mine and a, a close friend, I'd just like to pay my respects. And also to, to Josh, thanks for that. That was really powerful. And um, so I'm a, I haven't actually met Josh before, but I'm a Thompson from Bark Holden. And, um, I know our family relationships go back generations, so I'd just like to acknowledge um, Uncle there as well. Um, so I'll just share this screen, and forgive me if I did try this before. It should work, hopefully. Um, is that... Can everyone see that? I don't um, think you're in presentation mode yet. Oh, sorry. Yep, looks perfect. perfect. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess I, um, I, I met uh, Evan a few, probably a month or two ago now, and um, we've been in contact. And today, I just, I guess, I really wanted to speak around uh, cultural heritage and what that means for, for me personally and and my family. Um, so, I'm from. Traditional country of Bidra Karakara man from um, around the Carnarvon Gorge area, sort of central Queensland, um, where the red circle is. I got brought up in Inungai country, which is um, 
in the Black Circle, which is Bark Holden. Uh, so Bark Holden's a, a small little town. I think there's about 1,500 people there at the moment. Um, so I got brought up in the bush, very much in um, an extended family environment. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be brought up with my, my great-grandmother and uh, my grandparents and all, all my mum's um, family as well. So we're, we're one big mob out there. Um, but I just, I guess I really want to talk about connection um, today and, you know, what, what, what that means to, to me personally. Um, first of all, I work for a company called Regional Economic Solutions. It's a family business. My mother, Leanne Wilson, and my uncle own the business. Um, so I, we do community, specialise in community engagement um, and economic development in, in Indigenous communities. So that's basically what, what I do. But um, so Barcaldon's out in central central western Queensland, small little town. And this picture on the right, I'm going to sort of talk about um, over the next little bit. So I guess I, I got brought up in a, in a little property, a little 10-acre block, a 14-acre block, just where that red cross is just out of town. Um, and I guess there's the... Is the same. I got brought up in a really blessed environment. I believe I was in the middle of nowhere. Um, we got. I got grew up in that little green shack on the right of that of the house. The house come later on, but um, there's me, and my mum and dad in there, and um, we had, you know, everything I needed. But I think, you know, for the for this, it's really important for me to to talk about this place because it's, I guess, where all my my teachings happened all the all the lessons were, were passed down to me up here um it was a it was a traditional meeting place of the union guy people as well um as well as a contemporary meeting place because once we had that block out of town um it was a meeting place for all my family um i guess just a little bit about this so you know i remember when when was first mum and dad first bought this it was um it was just bare red dirt so it's sort of the last bit of red sand before it hits the black soil plains going up to Longridge. Um, and I guess the, the significance of this, these trees and stuff like that. So I was when when it was all bare, I remember going out when I was only sort of five or six um, with my, my grandfather and my father. Um, we dug all those eucalypt trees up out of out of a river, um, brought them back and, and planted them. So I mean, that's um, and also the the native trees you see there, they were they were all transplanted as well. Um, there's the next the next place I wanted to talk about is the next Red Cross. So just outside east of Barkhold and towards going towards Rockhampton, um, where that red dot is, is that's where my family, I guess, first started in in Barkhold and they moved over sort of from that Charleville Springshore area. Um, there was a. It wasn't safe for them to be there at that time. Um, there's various legislations where people were being removed. The pol native police um, station had just been shut down in Barcaldon, so um, my old people thought it would it'd be safe to, to move the family out there. Although they weren't allowed to live in town at this stage, if, so if you were lucky enough um, to not be under that legislation, which were removals and sent to missions and reserves, you were forced to live on little, um, what we call fringe camps on the outside of, of communities and towns, um, which is where my family started, um, just out, out, probably about five or six K outside of Bark Holden. Um, and these are my great, great grandparents. Um, you can see that as a large family. This is my direct family. There was a, little bit bigger um, mob there at the time. There was all my, you know, cousins and and things like that. But um, I guess with for this place, for me, it's obviously very significant and I, I would not want that disturbed under any circumstances because although it has a, a painful stories attached to it, it also has some really good stories of strength and um, with our community as well, with my family. Um, my grandfather's the the second oldest boy in that photo down the bottom. 
Um, so he was born out on this prop on this place, so he wasn't allowed to be born in the hospitals at this time. Um, so there's a tree, a particular tree, just at the back of where they're actually standing, that's still there today. And um, you know, just to see it with a without the history behind it, you just think it's a tree in the middle of nowhere. Um, but for us and and my family, obviously, it's um, probably the, the one of the most important things to us in, in our family to to keep where it is and and to to protect it at all costs. Um, also, there's there's graves and things out there. So the the family up the top, um, there was another three babies that were born into that family, but died during birth and um, as a result of not you know being allowed into the hospitals and. Uh, to to be born, so just that story in itself, we that whole area to us is is sacred ground and what what we would call our cultural heritage. Also around there, there's um that's where our, our um we make our didgeridoos. So all around that area is where all the box trees grow. Um, so they grow hollow, and um so that's where we teach our our young men through our um the coming of age sort of ceremonies, I suppose, to go out into that particular area, um, get get the right tree and shape it into their own didgeridoo. Very, very important part of um, when I was a boy coming into a man, um, part of that ceremony with, with my old, old people was around those box trees as well. Um, another place out, out in this place is what, what was called in that, I call the um, the echidna tree, the uh, porcupine tree. Um, as my son now keeps reminding me that we don't have porcupines in Australia, Dad. So I uh, was well, he's starting to sway me. We, we've called it porcupines uh, as long as I've remembered, but um, for this, I put in an echidna tree. It's a um, a very special tree to me as well, and um, you can see just above that cross. That's that's actually a big ski park. Um, which had just been put in in the last few years in Barcald, and beautiful place. Um, we have heaps of good quality um, groundwater on top of underneath Barcald, um, so that's what feeds that that ski part. But a part of that process, um, this this tree was obviously knocked down when they were clearing the area. Um, there was, I remember going out here with again as a as a young boy and. This, this particular tree was widely known in, in our family as that's where the echidnas breed. Um, and whenever you'd go there, you can see it's hollow on the ground now. It's um, It'd be just full of echidnas in the in the bottom of it. There'd be all these ground lice everywhere. And um, that was something that we were all told from, from birth that that's, you know, that's was our woolies and our coals right there. So it was something that we needed to protect in order to, for ceremony, we'd know where to go for, for these types of things. Um, obviously, now that it, I went out in a few years, oh, I must have went out on the 22nd of September 2020 um, to check on this tree, which I do every time I go home. And that's when I, I realised it had been knocked down. And, you know, just me having to go and tell my grandmother and um other members of my family that what I'd seen and um, it yeah caused a lot of trauma and, and stress just to know that we've sort of looked after that particular thing for for many generations and um, now I, I use it as a story it's obviously the roots are still growing and it's it's shot back um, so we try and tell us use this as an example of um, the stories of a new beginning I suppose and the importance of you know, having conversations before we, we do work. Because um, I'm sure it could have been avoided if we had that conversation. Um, so that that's just a, another another point. Um, another beautiful place out in Barkholden is a, as a river we call the Yellish River. Um, in the late 70s, my grandfather somehow managed to... Um, with the with the help of a lot of um, non-indigenous landowners, um, managed to get his hands on this little bit of property where the circle is, which we call the pocket. Um, so that this this area is 
where we spend all our time now. Um, Christmas as we all go out there. Um, you know, there's there's parts all over that property where he's built yards. He's, um, everyone's got story after story about this particular piece of land out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I was out there last Christmas and this was a very rare sight to see water in the river, to be honest. <laughs> it's um, out in Barkle and it's, it's um, all our water's underground usually, but it's yeah, we had a good we had a good year last year, so we managed to, to get some water in that that river. But this was, you know, as far as what's important to me and you know, on country and my connection to country is this is the first block of this is the first thing we ever owned as a, as a family. Um, we until then we've never had, I guess, ownership of land was never really a concept um, for us traditionally um we were you know part of the land we we were just a piece in the in the in the whole puzzle um obviously that's um changed a little bit these days so up until sort of the late into into the 80s actually um aboriginal people still weren't getting award wages um so i've never had the opportunity to to build any create any wealth this was the first thing um that we've been able to that anyone in their family has been able to pass on, I suppose. Um, it's a place where this is where we went and dug these trees. What I, show, what I showed you, I now planted up up at home. Um, this is where we, we my grandfather's a really astute horseman, um, done a lot of work on the land, but he is pretty well renowned for for his ability to break in and quieten down horses, um, which was obviously essential for that. Um, part of the country at that time. Um, this is where, you know, he used to take us out to, to teach us how to, how to burn country, um, the importance of, of burning country, um, the right times to do it, how to read the wind, all that sort of stuff. By no means am I, um, could even walk in his shadow with the amount of knowledge that he had, but um, that's where he, he passed on what he could to me at that, that age. Um, and you know, I like, I like to think I've kept a little bit of his, his story, but, uh, Jerry, he died pretty young, uh, 57, I think he was. So, um, there's still a lot of things, uh, a lot more time I wish I could have spent with him, but, um, this is where we, you know, he taught me how to find water. That was another one of his, his skills is, you know, where, where to dig bores and put windmills and, um, Knowing where to find water, and if I was lost in the bush, because um, I was never in town, I was always on a horse or a motorbike out out in the middle of nowhere. So, one of his biggest lessons was always, you know, what what happens if you're in a in an emergency? Um, water's the thing you need. And this yellow butterfly is is a a great example of what he told me to always look out for, particularly when these. It's I always follow the river, find the river. Um, these yellow butterflies will, will lead you to water. Wherever they land on the sand will be the closest to where the water is to the to the top. Um, and other things like, you know, there's there's other stories about brogas. It always tell me to follow the brogas because they'd always be flying to water. And different things like this. So all my, my cultural education was on this on this edge on this block of dirt. Um, so for me, you know, moving forward, if um, I'd like to protect that. Um, at all costs as well. Uh, so that that can obviously that knowledge can continue down in my family lines. Um, other other places around the um, another place is this beautiful um, the ghost gum that's again out in the middle of nowhere. Um, no one would think twice of pushing that over if we, you're pushing a road through to um, you know for exploration or, or or building something, but this has a really long history with with my family as well. And I've got an uncle, Uncle Frank Dancy, um, who's buried out there as well. Um, we now, fortunately, have a, have a little plaque and stuff um, erected underneath that tree. Um, but it's one of those things where if we don't have that conversation, you know, and, and we are pushing a road through to a mine or something like that. Um, that would be easily pushed over and, and that, that story would be lost. So that 
particular tree, you know, for me, connects me to that old man and connects me to the stories and and the, the knowledge that he's left behind. Um, and that's sort of how how that knowledge keeps going. Um, so every time I drive past that tree um, with my son now, it's the talking point to then pass on the knowledge that Uncle Frank left me. So if I didn't have that tree, you know, I could, it's, um, it's just one of those, those things that, that connect, connect the whole thing together. Um, I'll put this in for a bit of a laugh, to be honest. Um, we call this the lightning tree and it's the same, but it's, it's not, it is a bit of a laugh of a story, but it's the same principle. It's, there was an old man called, um, called Nugget Thompson. So he was my grandfather's cousin. Um, but he, he told me his, he was out. So we used to go out around this area um, hunting for mainly the porcupines. And back then before the cane toads were there, there was heaps of sanguinas out there as well. Um, so he was the one who taught me how to, to track the sanguinas. Um But out in this particular time, he told me a story and we was out there one day and he was bogged and it, um, we used to get the, the summer afternoon storms all the time. But anyway, his car broke down just when the storm was, was hitting and um, he had a, like he uh, had a little shelter that he made at the back of his car. You just sort of pull it out like an awning. He was sitting under there waiting for, for the storm to pass and it was hours and hours and he goes, all I wanted, boy, was just a cup of coffee or a cup of tea you used to drink. And um, I was waiting for hours. And anyway, this lightning hit this tree right beside him. Um, so he quickly went and grabbed that bit of lightning. And that's how he started his little fire. Um, but again, once I drive past that tree, that reminds me of, that connects me to that old man and his stories and, and the things that he used to teach me around um, hunting, like hunting that sanguine. So when I drive past that, it, it reminds me of how how I can track um, if I need to, you know. Um, and this, oh, sorry, this isn't actually the tree. Um, I must have put in a wrong photo there because it's not that's not the tree. But um, that that's the story that goes along with that anyway. Um, so I guess you know, for me when we're talking about cultural heritage and connection to country, I don't see it as purely a, a black and white thing. It's it's things that connect you to this land. And when you have a, a responsibility to to care for certain things and when you have so much story attached to, you know, just a, one particular tree out in the middle of nowhere that, it, you know, I've worked a lot in mining construction, particularly in the health and safety and environment. Um, management within one of the companies and once we start having these conversations so people realise oh yeah I just want to push that tree over because it's I have no idea but once if we're provided that opportunity to explain um, why these are culturally significant um, the effect that it would have on my family and the history behind an old Gigi tree out in the, in the middle of central western Queensland um I really think that's a, a really good place to start our relationship and our negotiations. Because um, you can imagine if someone pushed a, pushed my grandfather's birth tree over, um, that relationship would be severed forever. Um, but if we were provided that opportunity to say, oh, this is the reasons why we don't want this tree disturbed or this area, um, it's just a respectful um, process. So this... Um, and you can imagine, so this is just five, this is five, six of my little stories um, that connect me to this to this land. But there are six stories that I guess that would break me, um, it would break my family if if you know they, those particular trees or or that river was damaged or, um, and you you can imagine that's just I'm forty two this year, so. Um, you can imagine these these are just a quick and this is only sort of a, a 50k radius around one side of Barkhorn. Um 
you can imagine how many different stories are in you know that area if we took into account every every family member's story um for over 65,000 years um that's that's what connection to country means for me and I guess that's what that's what cultural heritage means to me is those stories that connect me to my old people and the stories that I can then be reminded from through trees or, or different landmarks um, that I can then pass on to my son. Um, I hope that makes sense. I, um, I'm really strong about building strong relationships. and I'm not, It's not about trying to stop progress or, or evolve. We've evolved for 60,000 years. Um, evolving is part of our culture, but it's we've got to do that in a respectful um, r- respectful and thoughtful way. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. I, I'm a little bit blown away, if I'm honest. Thank you so much, Lero, for being so open with your story. I don't think I really appreciated until you took the time to tell me how deeply woven through the landscape histories and personal stories really are. So I think that was a wonderful learning for me. It really was. And I think the the takeaway was that conversations are one of the most important tools we have to protect cultural heritage. Definitely. So, Thanks, Jenna. Thank you so much. Um, again, off the hook on any questions. Um, hopefully we'll have some engagement a bit later on. But I'll go to our last presentation for today. Um, Matt Denier is going to give us um, some of his story and some of what he's involved in. So feel free to introduce yourself, Matt. Excellent. Thanks, Janelle. And thanks to uh, JSQ and uh, UQ for inviting me. Uh, I just want to start by acknowledging the normal people uh, on whose land I'm coming from today. Um, so a little bit about my story first. Um, so I'm Matt Denyer. I'm the Principal Advisor for Indigenous Partnerships and Communities at the Minerals Council of Australia. Um, I clearly wasn't born into this role. Um, I've come from... So my history is that I'm uh, Gomeroy uh, or Camilleroy is the anglicised version of that. Um, my great grandmother was born uh, on Walholo Mission, just outside of Corinda near, near uh, Tamworth. My grandmother was born and raised on Terry Hi Hi Mission, uh, just outside of Moree. And when I say just outside of Moree, it's thirty four k south of Moree. Uh, my mum was born on uh, the Yumba at Charleville, and I was born. Uh, on Jarrawa Global country in Toowoomba. So that's where my definitely a uh, Queenslander. Um, and yes, I will be going to uh, the grand final this weekend and I will be uh, there in all of my Broncos paraphernalia. Luckily, my colleagues here in Brisbane, even Canberra, haven't had to deal with that. But what, I want to touch on... I don't really have a presentation, so you've got my dulcet tones for a little bit. What I really want to touch on was um, where we are as as an industry more than anything, and we're looking very much at uh, critical minerals. And for those that have read the Queensland Government Critical Minerals Strategy or the Commonwealth Government's Critical Mineral Strategy, that's what we're really uh, focused on at the moment for us and where a lot of my focus is at the moment. And sort of touching on some of the topics that we've that we've uh, touched on today through you know, listening to traditional owners, whether that's through Indigenous land use agreements or um, through co-management agreements, cultural heritage, really touching on those topics of native title, cultural heritage. What I say to a lot of my colleagues um, here in, in the MCA is that 
we should be treating native title and cultural heritage as business as usual in our industry, just like safety. Safety is business as usual. Um, so we should be treating both cultural heritage and native title as uh, business as usual. The things that we can do around the edges of that is cre creating those opportunities for intergenerational wealth. They're the things that we have a little bit of impact um, in. And so when you think about it from a critical uh, minerals perspective, well, sorry, not from a critical minerals perspective, if, if you think about it from the, the current economic uh, outcome, so in the 22, 23 financial year, mining as an industry, so minerals, just minerals. I'm not including oil and gas. Uh, I'm purely just looking at minerals. We contributed a record $455 billion in export revenue, which was a 10.5% increase on the previous year. So when you think about that flow-on effect that we're, we're having in regions and in communities, you know, we are doing that through direct employees. We are driving regional economic activity. We are supporting local businesses in our supply chains. But increasingly, this is an active business partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and traditional owners. So I mentioned it before, land use, Indigenous land use agreement. They continue to be the bedrock of our legal engagement. There's a, there is a fine line between uh, regulation and relationship. And the regulation is the tick the box, and we all do it, and we all do it well. But we need to work a little bit more on the relationship. That's, that's the critical part for us so as we look forward and we look towards the future through critical minerals as an industry we're also listening to our aboriginal and torres strait islander communities and to our traditional owners so what what i'm certainly hearing is that communities are seeking greater opportunities for benefit ownership right for the last 20 years especially under the, the Native Title Act, we've seen benefit sharing. What we want to do is change that from a sharing model to an ownership model. So it's critical minerals will create the next generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mining entrepreneurs. That's the thing that we need to, that's what gets me out of bed. Uh, each morning. So it's driving that long term intergenerational wealth uh, through Australian mining. So if I come back to the, a few things of where we are today, and, and it's strange when a lawyer starts talking about figures, I know, okay? But I'm going to talk figures here. Today, across the minerals industry, there's approximately 6,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people directly employed. Countless others uh, employed through our supply chains, either directly or indirectly. For the year to December uh, 2022, 730 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander apprentices and trainees joined the mining workforce. So that's an increase on 14% on 21 uh, figures. And the thing that I'm really celebrating out of the 2022 uh, figures is that 344 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander apprentices and trainees completed their training, which is again an increase of 11% on 21 data. So these are the future leaders of our industry. And we're in good hands when we've got this talent coming through. We can do better. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not jumping for joy. Um, I'm jumping for joy, but I'm not lying down. 
we need to do better in this area. But the simple fact is that the world cannot get to net zero emissions without the minerals industry. There's, there's no path. But there's also no path without creating genuine partnerships with traditional owners and with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So it's an evolving path of two black partnership. I don't think we'll ever, if we're ever, if we ever stop evolving, then we're probably getting it wrong. So we need to continue evolving in this partnership phase. One of the things that we as an industry are cognizant about, and we've heard it today. So our partnership is about how we work together to identify, protect and promote cultural heritage. It's a, it's a big thing for, for us. It really is. As much as, as much as it's nice to identify tangible and intangible cultural heritage and, and protect those, but we also need to promote it. We also need to showcase where we can. The next part of the partnership is also how we work with local communities and listen to local communities to increase their business capability and development opportunities that are sustainable for generations. The minerals industry uh, at um, our Minerals Week uh, just recently, we had a challenge put to us and it's one that we're uh, fully embracing. And the challenge that was, that was put out there was how do we engage more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on boards of management and increase those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders throughout our organisations? So that's my that's my work program. That's part of my work program uh, going into the next eight eight months is a concerted effort in that space. So our members are committed to seeing tangible outcomes in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And that's why you'll see that language has also shifted. We no longer talk about engagement, okay? Our focus has shifted to what are the opportunities that the community themselves desire. Our hope is that by talking about opportunities, we will see genuine partnerships and genuine benefit ownership. Partnerships mean more than just a seat at the table, but it's investing in the minerals companies to create those long-term investment opportunities, which creates that intergenerational growth. Ask Mob where the most engaged people ever. Anyone who you ask any of the four of us who have spoken this afternoon, and we will tell you that we are engaged forever. So let's learn from this history of engagement and drive a focus on opportunity, which I hope for the next generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander entrepreneurs, we create the possibility where partnerships and investments are things I actually hear about, but that I hear being talked about around the campfire when I'm an old man asking my nieces and nephews to come and get me a cup of tea, like my uncles and nephews used to do. So I started it by saying that it's a critical industry, and it is. It's also a critical opportunity. And um, I hope you all want to walk on this path together with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. I think it's such a such an interesting thing to contemplate. What if something has started to shift? If we're seeing this uptick in the last year do you think there is I mean this is a question I have do you think something is starting to change do you think there's some indication that attitudes are shifting in the industry that we're seeing this uptick in graduates coming in uh certainly I think the the there is a there is a huge shift in that but when you think about it um so I spoke a little bit about the leadership program and, and it's good to um, 
talk about the the individuals, the trainees and apprentices that are coming in. And we talk about grads that are coming in and they have a right place within our industry, but we actually need mid-tier uh, professionals uh, coming in to, to the businesses. And the, and the reason I say that is because when you think about somebody who's a apprentice, a, a apprentice trainee grad entering the mining industry in, in 2023, they are at least 20 years away from being a general manager of operations on a mine. Um, and I'm, I'm quoting, I'm quoting um, Brad Welsh, who's the CEO of uh, Energy Resources Australia. Um, you know, a, 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 a man who grew up in Redfern um, and he's now the CEO with uh, the, the largest um, rehabilitation uh, mine that's currently, that, that from a dollar value, is the largest rehabilitation uh, mine that's occurring. So it, the, our challenge as an industry is to continue streaming, um, it, when we talk about people, is to continue streaming those new entrants uh, people into into the industry, but it's also about how do we attract um, the the mid career professionals. You know, the, you can teach anybody uh, to to be a miner effectively. So it's how do we how do we do that as an industry? How do we make that more attractive um, for people to come in? And I mean, if I, I tell my own stories that. I when when I first started when I left government and started working for private industry, I actually had a meeting come up to me and say, "If you are looking for mining companies," you know, she didn't say it so nicely. There was a lot of other lot of words put in there. But I actually said to her, um, "I could be an activist on the outside, throwing words and not making any change." Or I can come into the industry, do the jobs that I'm doing, throw pebbles and make monumental change. That's and so that's the real reason I I do what I do is so that the next generation we all talk about leaving a legacy for the next generation, making it easier for the next generation. And I think that's why we will do what we do. The four people have spoken on, on this webinar this afternoon. I think that's why we do what we do in the fields that we do is so that the next generation and the generation after know about it, know what we've done, but also it's a hell of a lot easier just for them to, to, to do what they do. Yeah, I, I love that metaphor of being able to throw pebbles from inside to generate change. I'm going to hold on to that one and use that one. Please it, do. It's amazing what a few well-placed pebbles can do um, coming from the right person, especially. Um, I might, I, I'm aware that we've had some issues with the chat in this webinar. So I might um, invite the audience to, we invite the audience to join as panelists so they can, you know, turn the cameras on, ask questions, engage with our speakers in a more you know, personal way. So I might um, ask if we can have that process started up. Yep, I've got nodding happening. Um, but I think if I could just reflect on today, I first I want to say thank you so much to the, our four presenters. It's been a really, really wonderful and powerful session for me to be a part of, and I, I deeply appreciate you giving up your time and being courageous to share what could be quite difficult stories and, you know, be that voice of change in this industry. I, it, it blew me away how consistent the message is. It's, it's just about a shared future, shared coexistence and a positive path forward. And I think we've had four different takes on what that looks like and what's needed, but it's the same goal. Um, so people should be able to, 
unmute themselves, turn their cameras on, and if you've got any burning questions, uh, we might sit in here for, you know, an uncomfortable period of silence and see if we can prompt someone to say something. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kick this off with a question, Chanel, uh, instead of uncomfortable silence. Um, look, I, I, I've got a question for you, Marion, and for anyone, or everyone really, I suppose, but uh, I was very encouraging to see that the Path to Treaty Bill was um, had bipartisan support uh, with only, I think, four votes against the bill. Um, uh, but on those, so those four votes came from areas that have very high proportions of Indigenous people relative to other parts of, of the country, in, uh, so around Gladstone to Mackay and, and in northwest Queensland. I was wondering, you know, how how do we think, or how do you, how do your people think that guys that we might move towards more kind of understanding in in those particular areas where where, where these issues really are at, at the forefront? Good question, and um, and I'm thinking the the areas that are that you you just named um, in. So, so you said Mackay. What was the other? So it's really got the central Queensland, Gladstone. Yeah, really, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. From west of Townsville, all the way yeah. to the yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think historically, you know, some of those areas. Um, when it sort of comes to, you know, First Nations, um, you know, um, uh, or on a, a better term sort of issues, there there has been, um, I guess, pushback. I mean, when you even look back at the referendum, you know, there there was some of those regional towns, um, you know, that um, had the highest no votes, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, historic. I think there's sort of history, history there, but in terms of you know how I think it's going to be inevitable that um, engagement and um, and you know eventually when we get to that point of treaty, that it will happen. You know, I think um, at the moment, like we've we've got the legislation, so that's you know um, no one can do anything. Um, you know, essentially uh, about about that to piece of legislation, but I think when it comes to treaty, I think um, when we start seeing the negotiations happening, when it, when we start seeing our first treaties, you know, sort of um, being being written up and and agreed to, I think we'll get you know a lot more of those places on board, and I think it, it's at the moment, um, you know, treaty. We hear a lot about it, and of course, at working in government, of course we do. Um, but I think once community um, starts seeing the the resolve, starts seeing the the fruits of you know um, of what treaties can bring, I think um, that's when we'll start to see more, um, uh, yeah, more more buy in, I guess, um, in, into it. Leroy, do you have a, a view, particular view? Again, I think it comes back to having that conversation. I think that's where we're at, um, or where the, the government's at right now with this treaty process, is that, that first few, this next few years is going to be critical through this truth-telling um, process. Um, I think it's easy to form opinions. Actually, sorry, it's difficult to form opinions without the correct knowledge behind you. Um, I think we've all been through the same schooling system where we were taught nothing about um, First Nations culture before contact. Um, but equally, we got we didn't get taught anything about from contact up until now. Which you know, once and I've been having these conversations in in Rockhampton, like around in my groups in friendship circles in Rockhampton. Once people understand the true history, um, then that's when the sort of you see those light bulb moments when they think, oh, shit, oh, sorry. Oh, 
we really need to put things in place to to make up for that. Once you understand how these, um, why are there these challenges in our communities, the real reason why they're why they're there, I think it's people are a lot more open to to putting in th- things in place to to raise us back up. You know, um, absolutely. But, yeah, until we have that. Until we have that real conversation mm. and truth, we can't connect the head and the heart together to to make those decisions to move forward. So, I think it starts with that that truthful, I, honest, respectful conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I absolutely agree, and um, which is you know why they, um, you know, we're going for the truth and healing, you know, first. You know, we have to go through that. There. And, um, you know, it can't be, you know, there will be no treating without um, without truth-telling um, in the first instance. So I, I agree. I'll ask a question in that space. So as we, as we go through this truth-telling exercise, I've seen it talked about. Obviously, I don't have the experience myself, but there's a, a real danger that we expose histories that are painful to the people who are asked to share them with us it's a really difficult thing potentially quite a damaging thing so I suppose what I'd love to know is how can we best support our people that are going through this situation absolutely yeah absolutely so I I can I guess speak for what our department is is doing so um you know where we are doing up a framework um uh, a cultural safety I guess um framework um we would like to call it and it will include you know some of those um you know triggers those you know the trauma of you know hearing and reading you know about how um first nations like oh sorry queensland's history um but not only for first nations people but for non-indigenous people too who you know um when we're looking at documents you know those policies you know that were previously written or or um you know things that that our non-Indigenous people, um, sorry, colleagues have put their name to that might have had some sort of adverse or, you know, um, some effect um, on First Nations people and and communities um, that, you know, might be a little bit hard to to sort of now, you know, joining the dots and and, um, seeing the effects of of that work. So we're going to have to do a lot of work around supporting um, our our staff and our colleagues um, around that, and then you know on top of that, you know the the trauma for our community, you know as they go through you know this inquiry as well. So um, you know because they will inform that truth telling um, as well. So if you look at our department, you know being resources, you know one of the very very first, if not the first you know, um, department, you know, in Queensland um, in in terms of, you know, what we would think of a government department, you know, lands, you know, the Department of Lands or, or whatever the um, it was called, um, you know, the first iterations of it. It was all about land. It was all about, you know, um, you know, dispossession, you know, clearing of the lands to make way for industry across Queensland, not only farming and pastoral industries, but, you know, mining, um, and that as well, and you know the effects on you know having Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people removed from country to make way for you know um, uh, for government to you know acquire the land. So as a department, you know we've got to be brave and we've got to be we've got to own that and our part in you know in Queensland's history. And I know that. You know, we we have got great leadership who, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, um, are open, you know, to 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 um, to this narrative, and you know, will be um, supportive of of staff as we go through, you know, this truth telling um, phase. Yeah, no doubt that's going to be difficult 
to, to navigate. Um, mm. I think also, you know, it's in some respects acknowledging what has happened is part of the healing journey as well. Um, because up until now, it's sort of it's been denied. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's I haven't got the answer. Definitely haven't got the answer, but I, I, I agree. It's gonna it's gonna be difficult, but I think it's in the in it's a very important part of it. Um, but there's yeah, there's probably someone. I I, I haven't got the answer, but I, I agree it's going to be difficult, and it's going to be um, how we how we move forward through this truth telling process is going to be um, there'll be a lot of learnings come out of it. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I really do believe it'll, it'll strengthen, us, strengthen us as a state um, by doing that. I do that. too. Yeah. yeah. I think, any thoughts, um, Josh or Matt? Oh, sorry, Mary. No, no, I was just going to make one other point, and that was, you know, it's as much as, um, you know, non-Indigenous Queenslanders um, will, um, you know, might, you know, hear some things and, you know, see some things that they might not have known before. Um, out of out of this, um, our you know a lot of our First Nations um, people across Queensland, this will also be the first time that they're hearing and seeing some of this stuff because when you're living it, when you're living and breathing it, you know, um, and you you know that it's you know some of um, you know what's been passed down the intergenerational trauma, you're know, actually not knowing where it's come from. You know, and what was the you know um, the catalyst for for things being the way that they are today? You know, like Leroy, you know, talked about um, you know not being able to um, you know acquire intergenerational wealth. You know, um, and you know that can apply to you know health outcomes, to you know um, overrepresentation in the um uh you know justice system and and things like that where for generations that's all you know first nations people have seen and grown you know up with um because those very very early early years of you know being institutionalized and you know put on and grown up in you know um on the missions and reserves you know things like that 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 um, and for our mob, it's it's going to be um, it, it will be the start of their healing journey once they understand um, some of this stuff as well. I think it's and I'll jump I'll jump in as a Queenslander now. I think it's also opening it up to everybody to understand that so for anyone that lives in anyone that lives in Brisbane, you know, and you go into the C B D, just go that extra little bit out to Spring Hill where it says Boundary Street, right? That's that's where in the old days that's where us black fellas could that that's where we could come to. That we couldn't come any further than that. You know, you go to any any country town in Queensland and they've got a boundary street. You find that boundary street and that's where black trollers were allowed to come to. That's the so that it's that little simple stuff that I'm sort of hoping will come out of this um this process of the 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 truth part of it. You know, it's it's that when when we think about you know if you just take you know, I can I can do this on a on a screen. I probably wouldn't do it in a room full of people. But you take someone's own own story. So I said before I was born in Toowoomba. I was born in Toowoomba in 1983. So I'm 40 years old. Marion put something up on on her slides earlier about the Aboriginal Protection Act. 
I was born in 1983. The Aborigines Act of Queensland, 1936, was only repealed in 1988. So as, as a quarter caste, as I was called, that's what I was called because my mum was called a half caste. So I was called a quarter caste. Mum was put in the decommissioned uh, mother's hospital in Toowoomba where there was no heat, no air conditioning, none of that sort of stuff. So she was put in the decommissioned hospital, the decommissioned mother's hospital. And if it wasn't for my two... Uh, two white grandfathers, I wouldn't know my history, I wouldn't know my people, I wouldn't know my story, and I wouldn't be here today because they came to take me away. So when people talk about... And that's what, that's what quite annoys me when people start saying, oh, but it's a long time ago, it's... it's Long history. It's not. I'm forty, yeah. and it happened to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if that's the if that's the takeaway for for everybody, um, with regards to the process that Queensland is currently going to going through, they're the kind of stories that you're going to hear. They're the kind of stories that your colleagues, your friends are going to be telling, are going to be giving and um, the I, I, I jump with my my request is out of all of that is that we all talk about are you okay Dave? We do it all. But when we start going through this process in Queensland, we're going to be needing to ask a lot more of everybody, black and white, mm -hmm. because it will affect us all. Mm. Yep. Um, um, just had a question come through uh, for the chat. So I'll just read it out loud for the benefit of everyone. Uh, this is from Margaret Sweeney. Um, sorry if I missed this. I had to leave for a few minutes, but I'm wondering if there's been some thought to how to deal with truth telling when an Aboriginal person might hear stories about family ancestors that were abused, but also other family or ancestors who were uh, perpetrating the abuse. So a uh, tough question. Um, is there one of the, the panel who would like to, to lead off a response to that? EAP. I'm sorry, I'll jump straight in. In all of our organisations, we've got EAP. Um, one thing that most EAP providers uh, have learnt uh, through the process that the federal government is going through with the voice uh, referendum uh, there was a lot more focus put on um, and, and a lot of that came from um, a, a lot of that came from uh, sane and um, the the and, and the national Aboriginal uh, community control health organization in ensuring that there was enough mental health support. Uh, within our EAP systems, and 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 to the credit uh, to the EAP providers um, that are out there, they've really stepped up in this space. So that would be my if that that would be the the, the first port of call for 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 me in that regard is to go to those. In, um, in resources, we've um, we do have a. 
First Nations Network. Um, and as we did with COVID, um, when that first um, yeah came about, we um, we've increased our network meetings, and really just to you know help um, you know as an open forum to be able to you know talk about. Um, this stuff and um, yeah, help support each other through it. But um, but I agree, you know, there's there are EAP providers um, as well, and and really, um, and I think to having supervisors and managers understand, you know, that their staff and you know colleagues um, with. And you know, obviously, um, you know, First Nations people at the forefront, but non-Indigenous, you know, people are feeling, you know, um, if we want to refer to the voice, um, you know, feeling that too. I mean, I was, um, you know, sitting at my desk, and one of my non-Indigenous colleagues, you know, came up and was quite visibly, um, you know, upset and wanted to, you know, have a um, a talk about it, and. You know, so it's not, I think, just recognition that this is a really hard topic, you know, the, the, with the voice and, and referendum um, particularly. But as we go through, as, as we've talked about with truth telling and some of these really hard um, conversations and um, uh, information sharing, um, yeah, we are going to have to get um, put whatever it takes, you know, in place to help support. Um, our staff, um, you know, through through it, and which is p particularly why we've called, you know, as Queensland, um, the Truth and Healing Commission. And I think, um, or Truth and Healing, um, I think that when Victoria started theirs, that was one of their key um, learnings from when they were doing the Yor like the Yorick um, inquiry, that. Um, it, I don't. I don't think. Please don't quote me on it. But I don't think that they had that. Um, you know, um, in front of mind when they first started, but it was something mm -hmm. that evolved, mm -hmm. and they understood that was important. And I think we've just got to, you know, make time to mm -hmm. create those opportunities for people to to talk um, and. The environment, also to be able to do that, and we've been thinking about that, you know, through within our, our family and our community, we've been um, s sort of not bringing back, but providing more opportunities for our um, through our, our cultural um, processes to do that, and that's you know th things through like yarning circles and um, you know uh, going back on country or out on at our sacred site last week, um, taking some, you know, bringing back those roles of, of men's and women's business and some of the, some of the, the ancient practices that um, that have worked for so long for our mental health, we're, we're starting to really put an effort on in reviving them. That's just on behalf of, you know, my family, my community, but I'd be inter really interested um, if Josh would have a, a view on this as well. Um, being from that rural, remote sort of area, I think it's. Um, have you have you got a thoughts on that? Huh? Well, it's breaking in and out again. Just what was your thing uh, again? Your phone? Um, around um supporting people that may be triggered from going through this truth telling process. Um. It might trigger people that, you know, reliving that trauma. Also, if some of their family members were on the other side committing some of that trauma, how, how do we support them um, through that truth-telling process? I think the biggest biggest thing that we've found with a lot of the discussions we've had as Mythica people is we've been running an annual youth camp and a lot of these stories are coming out at the youth camps, the old people talking to the young people, and we spend a good sort of three, four, five days at some some of the youth camps, really going through what it means and how we can support one another through different situations, I suppose. So, 
it's having that good connection with your close family, whether it be your brother, your sister, aunties, uncles, whatever. Um, you've got to get that support system that, that works for you. Everyone's got, it might be friends for some people. Um, I've got non-Indigenous friends that I talk to a lot about this stuff and, and they've been extremely supportive um, yeah. as well as I've, I've had other people that I thought would be supportive that were completely unsupported and, and, and stuff like that. But that's, we're going to get that no matter what happens with, with talking about the truth. Cause there's as much as we're talking about um, the damage that's been done to indigenous people. It's also what I've noticed is, there's families coming out now that we ended up with this 50,000 acre property because my great great grandfather wiped out all the indigenous people on the on the oh, in the area oh, and oh. they're ashamed of it oh. how they ended up with the land and um, so I've got a few people that are like that so we, we talk a lot about these issues and and telling the truth and getting those stories out there. Um, a big thing that we sort of set up in, we've been doing a lot of research with Griffith University, U University of Queensland and other unis around Australia on, on our archaeological history as well as the family history and stuff like that. And we started an exhibition called Kirandary, Heart of the Channel Country, that's travelling around Queensland at the moment. It just finished up at Birdsville. But that tells a lot of... Mythicus history, the good parts, there's massacres in there and stuff like that. And that's the stuff people need to learn. The the trauma that our people went through and are still going through, um, because my great grandmother that we go back through, that's how that's who how we got Mythica country was from her. Um, she was taken away to Palm Island with one of the sons um back back in the day and, and that's not that long ago either um no. so um granddad was sort of left alone which was good only because he was he was working for um kidman at the time and he was a good stockman and a good driver so he, he got left out of it but i know mum and uh great uncles and aunties and stuff that sort of grew up in that time and and they were getting chased while granddad was away they were Grandma was hiding and ended up, granddad ended up taking the whole family in the drove and care, um, saying they all worked for him. Um, and that's the way they escaped getting taken away from country. Um, but the big thing with, with any of it is that support network around, around, around you as well as around other people, I suppose. And trying to keep an open mind from both sides, I suppose, is a big thing too. I know a lot of people struggle with it's, um, struggle with having that open mind on bo having both sides of the story as well. Um, they they believe in what they learned at school and that that's true facts and there's nothing yeah. else. Um, but we need to be able to teach this history of, of how Australia was formed and, and what was here before colonisation. So I think it's, and, and we're just one small part of the cog, but we're, we're doing our bit to sort of um, educate the people of Queensland about what he, what life was in the Channel Country pre-colonisation. Mm. Yep. Thanks, Uncle. Yep. <laughs> I've got a another question. Um, if I may, uh, this one to. Um, to Leroy and, and to Sean, uh, as you know, you guys do a fair bit of work out on country. Um, I've, with the cultural heritage clearances that I've done working in industry, um, they've been, uh, you know, they've been conducted by elders and experts in uh, identifying artefacts and sites and what have you, but not necessarily people who have, you know, a birthing tree on that particular piece of ground that you've cleared. And and, and thanks for your fantastic stories, Leroy. That's it really just something that's just opened my eyes and got me thinking about it is that all of these uh, red crosses, you know, 
like you said, 65,000 years worth of red crosses on a map. Um, how, how can we capture them and uh, record them and make sure that, you know, that, that they're there and understood? Uh, I mean, we can't always necessarily get the people who have lived on the land to be doing the cultural heritage clearances, but it's so important to, to be respecting that and and to be uh, avoiding doing any damage uh, where we can. Like, do you guys um, do you guys have any suggestions as as that, or any thoughts on how we can we can help protect that those sort of sites? Um, again, I think it's it's having that conversation early. Um, you know, it's quite often, and I agree with. Um, what Josh said earlier was quite often it's it's the last box to tick before we we, we do stuff and you know I think a lot and particularly you know with, with government it's we don't necessarily give the resources or the time to, to do that to have those conversations um, I think a, a, you know in my personal opinion I think we need a lot more time up front and it'll save you'll make up that time down down the back end of a, of that process. But we quite often have that short time up here. Then we spend a lot of that time in the back end trying to fix up problems. Um, and I just think it's you know if we shuffle that time around and spend a lot more time having those conversations, recording that stuff. Um, and I think the other the other thing is as well as the native t piece of. The native title legislation itself is such an exclusive process and it leaves um, so many people out of that conversation as well. You know, when we're talking about Queensland, I think we're talking about 10% of us uh, own that native title tent. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot more people living on country that um, might not necessarily be their, their traditional country but through no fault of their own, that's where they've been for generations. So um, the cultural heritage to them is still an important conversation to have. You know, it's um, it's it's an exclusive process that that leaves a lot of people without a voice. Um, so th I think that's a, that's a consideration. Um, how do how do we speak to to everyone? Um, but I think it's how we manage that how we use the time um, to have in that through that process of a project um, and to and you know unfortunately through previous pieces of legislation a lot of people haven't got um, stories as well detailed stories um, a lot of our, our knowledge holders um, are, are dying and you know a lot of that knowledge they've been too scared to pass on as well because, um, you know, if it was a lot safer, we found this through our, through our um, training that I do with Marion. It's um, to be up loud, proud, and a cultural man back up until you know, even into the eighties, it's it, it was putting a target on your back. So a lot of these things have been kept underground as well. So when, you know, when a government person comes out to a community and, and with their pen and paper wanting to record our stories, it's it's not really a safe environment to do that. So I think the, the process on how we do that, it can be achieved and it's got to be achieved for us now. Like, particularly my generation, it's we've got to start getting these stories written down and, and passed on from our old people now that it's safe to do so. But um, I think the opportunity... It hasn't been a safe. It hasn't been a safe environment to do this up until recent times. Um, a lot of our stories have been kept in with specific people um, and under lock and key because it hasn't been safe. But I think, yeah, time and and creating a safe environment for that to be able to do, it. and through cultural ways of of, of sharing information, um, you can't expect us to come into Brisbane, sit in an office, and and share, record these cultural stories, but come out on country. Um, we'll take you down to a river, river bank and um, we'll camp out there for a couple of days. And, you know, once that relationship's built, 
yeah, maybe those things will start coming then. But um, it's always for this stuff to happen. It's we've got to either meet halfway or, or come over, come into our, you know, come over to our side and we'll we'll, we'll talk about it there. I, that's just my personal opinion with that stuff. I'm, I'm really passionate about it too. I could talk about it all day, but um, I think it's you know. When we talk about culture and sharing culture, I think it's got to be done on country, you know, in the right environment, um, with strong, trusting, respectful relationships. Uh, yeah. Hey Matt, hey, Matt. Uh, uh, question. I guess an extension of what Leroy just covered off. Um, something you mentioned in your talk was about cultural heritage and native title um, being business as usual. Or it should be business as usual, much like a, a workplace health and safety. Uh, moment or, or something like that. I'm keen to get your thoughts on how best that could be done. How do we make it business as usual? And I guess the the second part of that question um, could business as usual dilute? I guess the the value of it. Um, yeah, just keen to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, business. When I, when I say business as usual, it, it's it has to be done. It's, it's one of the, it's one of the, Exactly like safety, safety has to be done in in our industry. So, uh, cultural heritage, native title, uh, sorry, cultural heritage and land access just has to be done. Um, I think how we can how we can do it better is, and this is a former. Uh, compliance regulator uh, talking, you know, compliance regulator and the lawyer talking is uh, get away from the ticker box. Uh, cultural cultural heritage at the moment is all about ticking boxes. That, that's effectively what it is. When we move away from, when we move towards relationships over regulation. That's when there's a that's when there's that fundamental shift in the way that we think about uh, doing things, and I think the the other the other major issue that sits there is that the cultural heritage is not just the role of the enviro team or the cultural heritage. Um, person on site when I say business as usual it's everybody has a responsibility in in cultural heritage from the mine manager right the way down right um, having having worked in uh, on site um, it was never cultural heritage was never thought of as a as an everybody responsibility it was thought of as a little the cultural heritage advisor has carriage of it the community team has carriage of it um but we don't really have carriage of it as as operations you know even in a in the commercial space we never thought about where the cultural heritage element sat because it had to be done you know, someone else took care of it. It, it. it wasn't something that I took care of. And so that's what I mean by safety. When we, on on site, when we start, we always do pre-starts and we talk about safety. You know, if we've identified an area of cultural heritage, we talk about a, a physical cultural heritage. I've been at pre-starts where we've actually spoken about it. But we speak about it once. We don't talk about it the next day. It's it's only ever when we identify it or when it's been brought to our attention. Or you know, don't go into that area over there because it's flagged off cultural heritage. But we don't know what has been identified. You know, that, that that's that's the part of the the industry as a whole. You know, with it. and it's not just uh, minerals, it's oil and gas, it's construction, it's pastoral, it's government. Everybody is involved in this. 
process in in understanding why that area has been flagged off. So it's not just saying that's that's a area of cultural heritage don't go over there. We need to explain why it's an area of cultural heritage. What what's the cause and effect of us coming over there? And I think the other the other thing that's really really critical in that is it, it's something that that Joshua touched on. It's and and by that I'll have an extension of it is that just because someone is an elder doesn't mean they're the expert on the cultural heritage space, right? So when we talk about capacity for our prescribed body corporates, our TO organisations and our, and our individuals within the TOs, our actual person, because it could be only one person within our PBCs or within our TO organisations who can designate the area of cultural heritage. So we have to be really, this is where we have to be cognizant with, with community in that regard. So that there, so when I say um, business as usual, that's the business as usual because as a, as a cultural heritage advisor, you know all of that. What I've just spoken about is, is the cultural heritage advisor, you know all of that. But does the person driving the dump truck, dump truck know that? Does the person in the D10 pushing dirt know that? So that's the that's the level of um, business as usual that we need to get to. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that response. Thanks. How I've seen that work well is um, on a side, like how it work on the ground, how I've seen it work well is including that stuff in the induction process, um, working with your, you know, your, your traditional owner groups um, to have a, a part in that in the induction. Um, I was at a site, um, well, Carapatina down in South Australia. I was um, working with Cookover, is the mob down there, and. Um, we were we identified our, our cultural heritage sites, and we actually part of our induction process is to take people out there, um, the ones that the traditional owners are approved of, show them the site, talk about the significance of it, tell tell, tell them personal stories about why it's important. Um, when people get that feel and um, and can see it and understand the significance, um, it creates a sense of ownership as well when you're on a site. And that, that's something that the people are proud of then because they've been involved in that, that process. Um, I found that really well, but in saying that, we don't resource that to happen. Um, it costs money, you know, to, to take people out on, on we need buses to, to, to drive them around. Um, it's up until, you know, I've seen one or two occasions where it's, um, been adequately resourced to be able to actually do that but I think for it to work well you've, you've got to you've got to show people you've got to be out on country uh, we can't this stuff it needs people to as I said before connect that heart and the head together and um, and be able to you know to to, to get that buy-in to look after these places and you, you can't do that unless you're there I think um, but that, that's yeah to add what value to what Matt was, was saying, I agree completely. That that part of the business is throughout everyone on site. This is what it is, this is what it means to us, this is why we want it protected. And the majority of people are good people, you know, once they realize once they understand the full story, um, it's it's that shared then we can move forward and share that responsibility of looking after our places. So yeah, thanks Matt, I agree with what you said, mate. Uh, Josh, looks like you've got your, your hand up there. Did you want to add to that? Uh, 
Anyone else having trouble hearing? Yeah. Can't hear you, Uncle. Sorry, Josh. Hi, right, Josh. Oh, there we go. Pretty well common practice out this southwest corner that that happens. Um, we've pushed fairly hard to make sure we're included in, in any discussions. But that's only because we are very proactive and we, we want to have that relationship formed with whoever we're dealing with, whether it be pastoralism, mining companies, tourism, any of that kind of stuff. Um, we try to embed ourselves and, and become the first port, port of call, I suppose, um, for any of these people dealing with us. Um, but I have seen it. I did your end as the chair of Mythica at one stage um, with a mining company and they said, what will it take to get this agreement across the line? And I said, well, we all got to come to the, some kind of an agreement. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. What's it going to take for you to get this agreement across the line? And I, I only, I, I was very naive, I suppose. I didn't think that stuff ever happened, but yeah. From first-hand experience, I've seen it happen, and I was wasn't very comfortable. I contacted the board straight away, um, and said, "Look, this is what's happening," and let them know straight away, just to be very open about what was happening. Um, it took us a further, probably six months, to rebuild that relationship with that mining company to get an agreement across the line. But I was that there, there would be other groups out there that are. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the word, right word is that would be more inclined to go down that way of doing business. And and I know of some groups that do go down that way. And I, I really urge, especially government, now that they're talking about reframing the relationships and all that in all the departments at the moment that I, that we're dealing with, are all talking about reframing the, the the relationships between Indigenous people and government. Is to make mining companies more accountable when that stuff happens. Um, and we're always, we've got to act in good faith as Indigenous people. Yet mining companies can turn around and try to bribe a certain party within that group to um, get an agreement across the line. And to me, that's not in good faith. But how do you, how do you prove against a mining company whether it's good faith or bad faith? Um, we slip up one little bit and it's not in good faith and the government approves a agreement that should never have gone ahead. Um, so I, I think with all the talk, the biggest thing that I'd love to see is more action of this stuff ha actually happening for boots on ground. And we've, we've been very um, fortunate. We've flown, we, we, the resource minister around and as also the new environmental minister around and showed them a mob of our cultural sites to give them a better perspective of why we want to protect Mythica country and the floodplains and the channel country as well. We also had an opportunity to fly um, Craig Crawford around to show him some of the sites and stuff as well. So we we're very uh, fortunate that we got those opportunities to do stuff like that. Um, a lot of groups don't have the opportunity to bring a minister out and show a minister some of their um, sacred sites and stuff. Um, we've got one of the largest sandstone quarries anywhere in the world, and all three of them, those ministers have seen those sandstone quarries in action um, in, in first person. Um, so, yeah, um, I think what, what you other fellas were saying about boots on ground and people coming out and actually connecting with country is the key to any of this stuff getting across the line because unless you see it, feel it, have a look at it yourself, you will not get – and you'll never understand that connection to country if you've never been to the country. Um, you can watch a movie about it. It doesn't do it any justice unless you're standing on the banks of the Cooper or the Diamond Tina Feeling all them 60,000 flies annoying you, you will not get the appreciation of country unless you've been there. So, yeah.
Do, do any of you think that there's scope for a big spatial database of um, cultural sites? Like I think, you know, I can go online and I can click on a map and go, oh, okay, this is a ecologically protected area for one reason or another and what species are on there or or I could go and look at a what well, click on a map and say okay it's this particular bit of geology but we do all of this work with cultural heritage clearance uh with with traditional owner groups and I'm not sure that it the the results of that work necessarily get preserved long term and it's very much sort of company by company um even drilling campaign by drilling campaign or or whatever, and I, I, do you, while it the, it runs the risk of pushing people back to a desk and a computer and not getting into the country, which I, you know, and there's a very real risk of that. Um, do you think that there's um, use for it? Do you think that would be a useful addition uh, and it's something we we could do? Or maybe we already have it, and I just don't know about it. There's there's something there's something that loosely exists now at, um, I'm going to be rude because I need to look at the the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. So they've got something very loosely around that. However, it's not, it's not, um, it's not fulsome. So the National Native Title Council uh, is also looking at that, and they're the they're the uh, ones that are part of the um, First Nations Heritage Protection Alliance. So there's so there's some ideas that are being um, floated around um, on on cultural mapping. There was a paper. There was a paper that um, that. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to remember who the there was. There was a paper released on the weekend uh, uh, by the National Native Title Council with regards to uh, cultural heritage, like tangible and intangible uh, cultural heritage mapping. Um, so I strongly encourage, uh, and, and I'm going to direct people there, but I'm pretty sure it is uh, on their website. Um, if not, I've I've got to jump off this call, and I'm on a call with the CEO of NNTC uh, in a bit of uh, twelve minutes, so I'll I'll ask him um, then. Probably another one that's out there already too is Dapsit. I know they don't have. It's not the best one to work with. It is. I know as a person that puts stuff on Dapsit, it is very frustrating to add a lot of stuff, especially if you've got a lot of sites. Like we've we've got probably 800 documented sites that we've got so far and trying to put them onto Dapsit is extremely hard. Um, I think mining companies need to use Dapsit a lot more than they currently are um, when they're looking at future projects and stuff like that as well. Um, we've developed our own sort of internal way of mapping things but yeah obviously if we're talking to people and um different groups and stuff we we produce it but um it, it's not actually online or anything like that it's just we use google map more than anything and put all the sites and stuff on it and the song lines and stuff and that intangible history too that intangible cultural heritage side of things is something that people have really got to start recognizing a lot more um Yes, we can physically see a site when it's a grindstone quarry or it's a fill creek quarry where you're developing stone tools, but that intangible history is just as important, if not more important, than those cultural sites. And that's something that I find very hard to get across to anyone. Why is that a song line? Well, why do we have to worry about it? It's 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 just a imaginary line, um, but there's a lot of history behind that line and why it's there. All right, I'm very mindful of the fact that we are already 15 minutes over time and I'm sure people have uh, <laughs> to have to go to other things with their afternoons or evenings. Um, I 
want to just express my heartfelt thanks for all the people who have given up their time today to both listen to all these stories, but to to give us these stories. Um, I think it's been one of the most powerful webinars I've been a part of, to be honest. Uh, and I hope that this sort of thing becomes more common as we move forward through the process of treaty in at least Queensland, hopefully all of Australia. Um, so I might call a wrap on that one there. Thank you again so much uh, for everyone being involved.